Thank you. Um, oh God, we're really dark, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry, another cheery one. Um, the dark side of UX, uh, user experience and the ethics of persuasive design. Persuasive design is, yeah, you can kind of figure you've got UX, which is, uh, you know, supposed to be good. You get good UX, which is all about ensuring the customer gets exactly what they want really quickly, whatever they came to your website to achieve, um, they do. This can stem from areas such as design, accessibility, even things like colour theory. Um, also psychology. Psychology plays a big part in design. Um, this isn't necessarily new. This lies at the heart of advertising, wartime propaganda, you know, all that kind of thing. So there's the psychology they call it, in terms of UX, they call it pet design. Um, persuasion, emotion, and trust. It's designed about altering people's perceptions and getting them to reach, a reach the conclusion that you want them to, to arrive at. There's the psychology of reciprocation, that if a site or an app or a business does something nice for you, you'll end up doing something nice for them. So something like free postage, a voucher off your first purchase, that kind of thing. The psychology of scarcity, or scarcity, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, which encourages a user to believe that an item is limited edition or running out fast. You see this on Amazon where they say that they've only got five left. This also makes the user think that lots and lots of people are buying the item, which brings us onto social proof. Things like reviews and testimonials that you're convincing the user that the product is really popular everyone else is doing it and ultimately we are kind of a herd animal and we'll follow the crowd. So if this feels kind of uncomfortable or, or weird um, to be encouraging people, um, you know, it's a spectrum. And here we've got kind of the most extreme end of the spectrum, which is to outright deceive your customers as part of your UX. In 2010, a UX designer put together a website which would name and shame websites that use their um, interface to trick customers um, outright. Basically, they would put items in the basket that they hadn't ordered. They would have forced continuity where you couldn't get out of deals that you didn't really want to sign up for anyway. And in one famous example, Ryanair um, hid the option to not be insured, which was do not insure me, in a list of countries. It was nestled in between Denmark and Finland. So this is like outright deception and it was outlawed in 2014 under consumer law. So it's, that's, that's the extreme end of the spectrum. So you've got your good UX, you've got this kind of, of UX, and then in the middle you have persuasive UX where you just persuade your customer to do what you want them to do. And that's okay because persuasion's all right. We've all got free will. We, we, we don't have a gun to our head. Um, and, and everyone's free to resist. Um, so on, the, on the, the gun to the head idea, we have a voting card. Um, let's say persuasive design is nothing new. This is a persuasive design from 1938. Uh, this was an election. Um, a few UX clangers here, I'd say. We've got uh, the conflation of two questions. Do you approve of the reunification of Austria within the German Reich? That was enacted uh, in 38. And do you vote for the party of Adolf Hitler? <laughs> So um, the yes is centered, which again to the, to, the, to the eye makes you think it's the right answer. No is a little smaller. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and this obviously wasn't a particularly free election. There was a, a gun to your head. And there was something like a 96% uh, uh, success rate on that. So are people being persuaded or coerced? And when does persuasive design become coercive design? Uh, probably here in Vegas. <laughs> so Vegas, all right, why Vegas? Because Vegas is where coercion and persuasion just collide. When persuasion becomes coercion, it's better that way around. In Vegas, the casinos do not make their money from the table games, which are games of skill. They have few winners and high payouts. They make their money on the slots. They are repetitive, small, frequent rewards, very easily learned, cross-generational appeal. And it's the design tricks that have been honed on 100 years of designing slot machines that tech companies are now 
interested in adapting for their applications, even down to smartphones being accused of being a slot machine in people's pockets. Every time you check your phone, you're playing the slots. You want to, it, it's a low risk pull of the lever to see if you get a very small reward. And again, is this persuasion or is it coercion? Uh, Mark Mikel was a UX designer who once worked for a gambling company and he quit and now writes on this kind of topic. He saw firsthand some of the methods that were employed that were taken kind of from the, the, the slot machine design. Minimal learning curve, so they're really, really simple to learn, um, not even you know, needing particularly complex instruction. Like the slots, they convey an air that the game is about luck or randomness when they're not like the slots, they are programmed to only pay out at certain times. Speaking of payouts, apps have begun to include the, the, the concept of near misses. They found in the late 70s that if people won big on the slots, they'd be snapped out of the zone and they'd stop playing. Some, uh, so now they went from a big win about 3% of the time to a small win about 45% of the time. The smaller win keeps people playing. They even find that people, when they win, it interrupts their flow and they actually get angry that they've won and they want to kind of continue on. A lot of casinos and now a lot of apps, you know, in terms of gambling apps and gaming apps, will use credits rather than cash to mask how much you're actually spending. And uh, casinos took an idea from the tech industry, which was data mining. Um, they had gamblers use cards as they went around the casinos to work out exactly where they're going, how often, how much they're winning. And this comes back to the psychology of reciprocation. They could give out prizes, cruises, uh, hotel trips um, to keep people coming back. Dun, 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 uh, this was um, a quote, kind of shoehorned in here. Uh, an anonymous UX designer who was asked um, this when they went for an interview, whether they minded working in an industry without a moral compass. And I think that's just something to think about as creators and designers that you may be asked to create something that doesn't necessarily sit right morally with you. Um, the idea that this, that this came from for me is that I had a very short term working in debt collection, which meant I had to ring people up and I was being told to do things that I was not necessarily comfortable with. And so I walked, but it's not always that easy. And it can kind of be part of the tech industry as well, that you could be asked to design things to keep people on your website longer than they intended, perhaps even do things on the website that they never arrived to do. It's not necessarily flying under the radar. There's been a heightened awareness lately, especially in terms of gambling apps um, and the designers who are making the sites. There's going to be a restriction on any ads or designs that create a false sense of urgency. There'll be, none on this, there'll be no more free betting. They usually came with conditions that meant that you had to spend another £250 just to cash out. There was, um, and there's going to be a clamp down as well on the, the fourth bullet point there, is that some places were just advertising gambling as a solution to your financial worries. Um, and again, at the other end, they would appeal to a customer's sense of conviction or rebellion and kind of play on low self-esteem. And it's really just preying on the vulnerable, basically. And they're going to be trying to, to tighten that up. But that's a stream. I mean, we're talking about gambling apps here, and you're thinking, I'm never going to work on a gambling app. But there's, there's other apps as well where they will be asking these same kind of, of design kind of queries of you. There has been a bit of a debate amongst designers as to whether there should be a design code of ethics. Um, but no one can agree on what it would be. So many designers simply adopt a personal code of ethics that they focus on what the customer wants. Uh, not to coerce his customers into to do things that they didn't already want to do, and to feel empowered to stand up for themselves if a company was to ask them to design something that they didn't necessarily agree with morally. Companies themselves, but companies themselves should aspire to value brand image, credibility and trust rather than the short-term financial gain of a design that is a little more deceptive. <laughs>